insanely expensive construction mistakes in the world. What do you deem an expensive mistake in life? Divorce, loss of property, gambling addiction? The truth is that we all make mistakes every once in a while. Learn from your mistakes is what one is usually comforted with after messing something up. Some mistakes, however, can be found to be quite expensive, costing billions of dollars, or could be even worse with lives at risk. Architecture and construction are some fields where even a minimal inaccuracy can become calamitous. That said, what are some of the most expensive construction mistakes in the world? Let's find out. 5. 20 Fenchurch Street Building, $12 million. Built in 2014 and designed by architect Rafael Vignoli, 20 Fenchurch Street, nicknamed the Walkie Talkie for its distinctive shape, is part of a project to build skyscrapers in the heart of London. Originally planned for a maximum height of 200 meters, the original plan was scaled back to avoid visual conflict with the Tower of London and St. Paul's Cathedral. These modifications to the original plan reduced the size of the tower to 160 meters and removed the balconies originally planned for the facade. While this change may seem minimal, the absence of overhangs has had an impact on the lives of all surrounding residents. In fact, the smooth concave shape of the tower, coupled with the glass covering it, causes a high concentration of solar rays at certain times of the day below. These hotspots can reach up to 117 degrees Celsius and have caused, among other things, the bodywork of a Jaguar to melt, shop fronts to catch fire, and several tiles to come off neighboring boutiques. These infamous events have earned the area worldwide renown, and a huge sunshade was even erected until a lasting solution could be found. However, another concern was the height of the building. Facing directly into the southwesterly wind, it causes gusts of wind all around the building, forcing the wind to rush in forcefully at its foot. After installing sunshade fins on the facade to block out the sun, wind turbines were added to block the wind. Due to the extreme heat, there have been reports of cracked tiles, charred carpets, melted paint, and as mentioned, even cars. These incidents brought another name to the tower, the Walkie Scorchy. A sunscreen was placed across its curved face to reduce the glare, but fixing this architectural mistake cost about 10 million pounds. 4. Lotus Riverside Complex, $30 million This is a real estate project comprising 11 residential and commercial buildings, all based on the same 13-story model located in Shanghai near the Lianhua River. The Lotus Riverside Complex, also known as Lotus Riverside Block 7, was one of these residential buildings. Construction began in 2007, with the inauguration scheduled for 2009. In order to complete the housing, an underground parking lot was dug to the south of the building, and the reclaimed earth was placed to the north of the building to gain space. At the same time, heavy rainfall disrupted the work and intensely moistened the soil. The pile of earth, rapidly reaching a height of 10 meters, exerted a considerable force on the ground near the building and, accentuated by the rain, slowly slid towards the ditch to the south, crossing the reinforcing pillars of the building. The thrust was so powerful that it shattered the pillars, dragging the entire building down with it. The complex collapsed shortly before opening to the public, causing much debate. While the windows and facade remained virtually intact, the very foundations of the apartments were called into question as a fault in the construction of the buildings themselves. This led to panic among the recent purchasers, who withdrew their offers and sought full reimbursement. In the end, six people were found guilty of non-conforming construction and corruption. The developers faced losses of up to $30 million as compensation to the homeowners as well as construction expenses. 3. Sydney Opera House, $62 million Every project, regardless of subject matter, starts with an idea and ends, if successful, with a functioning reality of the idea's intent. Projects that fail are sometimes considered losses, but most often, 
they also offer excellent lessons on how to avoid repeating the failures in the future. The Sydney Australia Opera House is a notable example. You can't tell from looking at it, but Sydney Australia's iconic opera house is actually a study of a project failure. Its original plan had a four-year timetable and a $4.5 million budget, but in the end, it took about $66 million and 14 years to complete, overstepping the initial budget by a whopping $62 million. Fortunately, the final product more than met the expectations of opera goers, the world's architectural community, and ultimately, the Australian government, which recouped the massive cost after only two years. How the project rolled out over time offers a series of abject lessons in how not to manage a construction or any kind of project. But what really happened? In 1957, Australia's government held a contest to select an architect to design its future National Opera House. The client's primary focus was to showcase Australia's creative and technical capabilities, and it set almost no parameters on the building's cost or construction time frame. In 1958, the winner of the competition, Jorn Utzon, presented his Red Book of the Project, which contained details of some, but not all, of the elements of the overall project, such as designs, consultant reports, and varied plans. The Red Book was not a comprehensive working document for strategizing the construction of the building. And even though Utzon clearly stated he hadn't finished the structural design, the client insisted on immediately beginning work on the project anyway. From there, things went from bad to worse, with contributions to the growing debacle amassing over time. Not only did the project launch with no finalized plans to follow, but the client also changed the floor plan from two theaters to four shortly after construction began. Compounding the chaos that followed was the lack of a project manager. Instead of a single person to whom to turn with questions and for direction, an ad hoc partnership between Utzon and the engineer, Ove Aru, handled management of the project, assisted by a hastily assembled team of electrical, mechanical, and HVAC subcontractors. Since each separate management team member had different goals and perspectives from the others, it's not surprising that finding consensus among them was often an elusive goal. Not having a finalized design also meant not knowing how much the project would cost. Almost immediately upon its start, costs began escalating, first with the change orders and then with the discovery that the site surveys were wrong. The budget went uphill from there. Utzon's vision divided the construction project into three segments, the podium, the outer shells, and the interiors and windows. By the end of stage one, a government monitoring committee was overseeing payments and had to withhold a few until it received proof of completion of actual work. By 1966, seven years after it started and four years after the proposed completion date, the Opera House had not yet completed phase two. Utzon left in frustration, taking his designs and plans with him. Management of the rest of the project fell to a committee of three Australian engineers, who completed phase two by the end of 1967. However, because the next phase required an entirely new set of plans, the budget to complete the construction soared to 85 million Australian dollars. Another four years and an additional 17 million Australian dollars went by before the Opera House was finally completed in 1973 when Queen Elizabeth inaugurated it. Two, the Aon Center, $80 million. The Aon Center, built in 1974 and known then as the Amoco Building, is one of Chicago's tallest structures today. Initially, the structure was an architectural wonder to the city a simple rectangular tubular steel frame structure. What made it stand out was its cladding with Carrara marble imported from Tuscany, making it the world's largest marble clad building. Initially, the building was constructed as the headquarters for Standard Oil of Indiana. In 1974, the building changed names along with the company in 1985 to become the Amoco Building. It was later sold and renamed in 1999 and is now called the Aon Center. 
At present, Aon Center flaunts to be the fourth tallest building in Chicago, with a total of 83 floors above the ground level, achieving a height of 346 meters. The architect was Edward Durrell Stone, and after its construction was completed, as mentioned, it was the world's tallest structure with a marble facade. Chicago's most common natural disasters include severe storms, floods, tornadoes, winter storms, and power outages. Another mischievous component is the heat waves, which are the principal reason behind forest and bushfires. On days with peak high temperatures, these heat waves can be problematic and hazardous to the facades of Chicago's buildings. For the facade, the architect Edward Durrell Stone recommended to use thin Italian Carrara Alpha Gray marble slabs, stating that they would be long lasting and outstanding. Around 43,000 marble slabs were installed on the building's facade. Each slab had a size of 50 by 44 inches and was approximately 1.5 inches thick. Slabs were connected to steel structures through bolts. But this was where Aon Center stepped into the failures arena. After almost 12 years of exposure to Chicago's large temperature swings, much of the facade began to deteriorate to dangerous levels. Thermal hysteresis, which is basically extreme thermal cycling, caused the thin marble slabs to bow outward permanently. As marble is a brittle material, it develops plastic properties over time, so the bonus turned into a permanent deformity, resulting in a substantial loss in the material strength. In 1985, during inspection, the team discovered several cracks and bows in the marble. Previously, on December 25, 1973, during construction, a 350-pound marble slab detached from the facade and penetrated the roof of the nearby Prudential Center. To try and correct the wrongs, initially, stainless steel straps were added to hold the marble in place. Then, in 1990, the whole building was refaced with two-inch thick white granite. That is, each of the 43,000 marble slabs was replaced. Hence, adding $80 million to the $120 million project, making Aon Center one of the costliest architectural blunders in the world. 1. South China Mall, $1.3 billion Despite boasting a humongous 7 million square feet of leasable space, the new South China Mall in Dongguan, China has remained largely vacant. Built in 2005, the massive complex was hailed as the world's largest shopping center and expected a daily visitor count of 100,000. However, given that the vast majority of Dongguan's population is made up of migrant workers, the impersonal shopping mall failed to draw close to the desired numbers. Despite an unsuccessful relaunch in 2007, with the addition of the term new, the mall lacks convenient transport links or nearby airports, making public transport journeys lengthy even for those who live nearby. The mall was the brainchild of Alex Hu Guurong, a Dongguan native and billionaire instant noodle seller. According to the New York Times, the mall cost around $1.3 billion to build. The layout is organized into seven zones, each representing a city, country, or region such as Amsterdam, Venice, Paris, Rome, Egypt, California, and the Caribbean. Designers spent two years scouting locations for these zones around the world, and ample parking lots were built in anticipation of a large number of drivers. It was ultimately a failure. Although the scope of the South China Mall was unlike anything ever seen, the designers failed to factor in one of the essentials of the building, location. The mall was constructed in the middle of nowhere, nearly three hours from any major hub of people, leading to its demise. It still sits mostly vacant, making this a costly mistake. And that's all from us today. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to click on the subscribe icon below. Also, give us a like, share the video, and remember to turn on the notification bell for timely updates of our latest uploads. Until next time, thank you for watching.